I'd like to take a moment to let you all know about a new nonprofit organization started by my brother Craig. It's called Treats and Truth. They fill oversized brown lunch bags with snack items, chips, crackers, popcorn, cookies, etc. Also, a bottle of water, toothbrush, toothpaste, sanitary wipes, and most importantly, a small gospel tract book of John. No cigar? I'll have to talk to him about that. The bags are then hand-delivered to the homeless and people in need in and around the Los Angeles area. Let's help get this ministry off the ground. They're a 501c3 tax-exempt organization, so any and all donations are tax-deductible and greatly appreciated. Visit their website at treatsandtruth.org. Check out the show notes for the link. Also, please follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you. to episode 80 of the Burning Bush podcast, where we share the message of the Bible while enjoying a good cigar. Hope you're doing well and glad you've joined me today. This week, we continue reading through Dr. Justin Bass's book, The Bedrock of Christianity, The Unalterable Facts of Jesus's Death and Resurrection, and I'm smoking the Avo Classic number three in the seven and a half, or in, yeah, the seven and a half by 50 size. And of as often happens, their website doesn't have much detail about the cigar, so let's go over to Cigars International and see what they have to say. Avo Cigars are one of the most prestigious brands on the market. Avo Cigars are the result of a collaboration between Hendrik Kellner, Avo Uvesian, and Davidoff. Avo Uvesian is a composer, perhaps best known for penning Sinatra's Strangers in the Night. Together with Kellner's cigar-making skills and Davidoff's reputation, Uvesian's quest for perfection in a cigar has resulted in this one terrific blend. In fact, more than 2 million of these super-premium sticks are sold annually. The Avo Classic Cigar is a beautifully constructed piece from the very finest premium leaves including a silky Connecticut shade wrapper and Dominican long filler leaves. The result is a creamy, smooth taste and wonderful aroma. Secure yourself a box of these today and rest assured you've always got a great blend to rely on. Avo Classic has earned a 90 rating, noting there's a sweet tea quality to this cigar, complemented by a graham cracker note, picks up some intensity as it goes. It is a mild to medium uh, profile. Wrapper is Connecticut, Ecuador, Connecticut, and Ecuador sun grown. Binder and filler are both Dominican. And the Vitolas are the number 9, 4.7 by 48. The Robusto, 5 by 50. The number 5, 6.9 by 46. The number 2, 6x50, the number 2 Tubo, 6x50 as well, the number 3, 7.5x50, the number 6, 6x60, and the Pyramid, 7x54, and the Bellicoso Classic, 6x48. That is the Avo Classic. So let's go ahead and get back into this week's reading of Dr. Justin Bass's book, The Bedrock of Christianity, and the title of this week's section is The 500. The creedal tradition attests, after that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, and Paul probably added these words to the tradition, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. 1 Corinthians 15, 6. 
In John Wesley's commentary on the New Testament, his note on this appearance says, a glorious and incontestable proof. The greater part remain alive. If, this, if true, this is indeed a glorious proof. If you did not know where this resurrection appearance was found, you might very well believe it must be legendary. Over 500 men and women at one time believed they saw the risen Jesus? This is too good to be true. We expect to find such an incredible claim alongside other fanciful accounts of Jesus and his apostles from the 2nd and 3rd centuries AD. In the 2nd century, the Gospel of Peter, for example, has a clearly legendary account of Jesus' resurrection. When Jesus' disciples arrive early Sunday morning, a cross bursts out of the tomb, hovering in the air, and even speaks to them. We can imagine that at the end of this legendary story, it says the risen Jesus appeared to more than 500 men and women at one time. Yet this most incredible resurrection appearance is not found in a legendary account from the 2nd or 3rd century. It is not even from the latter part of the 1st century where many of the New Testament writings can be dated. As we saw in chapter 3 above, this tradition goes back to within a decade of Jesus' death and probably earlier. Furthermore, Paul adds to, the, to this tradition for his Corinthian readers, or hearers, most of whom remain until now, meaning most of these 500 eyewitnesses are still alive. Paul is piling on the evidence for Jesus' resurrection here. Even scholars who do not believe this event really happened agree that Paul is appealing to these living eyewitnesses as proof that Jesus rose from the dead. C.H. Dodd explains, There can hardly be any purpose in mentioning the fact that most of the 500 are still alive, unless Paul is saying, in effect, the witnesses are there to be questioned. Paul is in a sense saying to the Corinthians in the mid-50s AD, go on your next holiday to Galilee or Jerusalem and meet some of these eyewitnesses. They will tell you what it was like to see the risen Jesus. We see other ancient historians using the same kind of argument Paul is using here. Josephus argues at one point the truthfulness of accounts of his own life because even over two decades later, People are still alive who can either prove what I say to be false or can attest that it is true. Antiquities 20.266 Paul is also writing this letter to the Corinthians roughly two decades after Jesus' resurrection appearances, including the appearances to more than 500. Paul and Josephus are both making appeals to living eyewitnesses who can attest that this, it's true. Travel was quite common in the, in the ancient Roman Empire. Where, then, would the Corinthians have traveled to meet some of these eyewitnesses to hear first-hand, uh, first-hand accounts of Jesus' resurrection? Some were in Jerusalem, no doubt Peter, James, and perhaps others of the Twelve. But this appearance to the 500 most likely took place in Galilee. Josephus tells us that Galilee contained many villages, and the smallest of them contained over 15,000 inhabitants. Jewish Wars 3.41-43 through 43. Josephus is notorious for exaggerating numbers, which he's probably doing here, but this still implies that a group of over 500 gathering in the open somewhere in Galilee is possible. This appearance to the more than 500 may even be the Galilean appearance recounted in Matthew 28, 16-20. Jesus' brethren, the same Greek word is used in Matthew 28, 10 and 1 Corinthians 15, 6, are told that he will appear on a designated mountain in Galilee, Matthew 28, 10 and 16. We can imagine that when they gathered at this mountain, the word spread and hundreds of people men and women, followers and skeptics, 
gathered quickly to see this appearance of Jesus. Incredibly, Matthew even testifies that some were doubtful, Matthew 28, 17, which implies a larger gathering than Jesus' 11 followers. Whether this is the same event, I agree with William Lane Craig's conclusion. Regardless of where the event occurred, Paul's tradition and personal comment attest to the fact that there were literally hundreds of people about who were known in the early church and who had been at an assembly where they experienced an appearance of Jesus and who were ready to testify to the fact. It is quite amazing. It is quite amazing. Many scholars express unwarranted skepticism concerning this appearance to the more than 500. For instance, Ehrman accepts the historicity of the resurrection appearances to Peter, the Twelve, James, and Paul, but he is skeptical about the 500. If it did happen, he admits, it defies belief that this could have been imagined by all 500 at once. There is a certain force to this argument. This is undoubtedly true, but he goes on to say, It does need to be pointed out that Paul is the only one who mentions this event, and if it really happened, or even if it was widely believed to have happened, it is hard to explain why it never made its way into the Gospels, especially those later Gospels such as Luke and John that were so intent on proving that Jesus was physically raised from the dead. Ehrman's argument, then, against the historicity of this appearance to the 500 is ultimately an argument from silence. If this really happened, then why do we not see this appearance in the Gospels? For one thing, I have argued that it is found in the Gospels, in Matthew 28, 16 through 20. But even if this is not the same event, this is not a sufficient reason to reject it. We have already seen the incredible restraint of the authors of the Gospels. At least Luke and possibly Mark knew of an appearance of Jesus to Peter, yet we do not have it recounted in any of the Gospels. This is also true of the appearance to James mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15.7. Where is the account of Jesus' appearance to his own brother and the leader of the Jerusalem church? Acts 12.17 15, 13, and 21, 18. If the Gospels are silent concerning the resurrection appearances to Peter and James, two appearances Ehrman accepts, why then not accept the historicity of the appearance to the 500? Another argument Ehrman puts forward is that when Paul received it, it was already legend, that is, made up. I'm not saying that Paul necessarily made up the story of the 500 500 himself. He may well have inherited it from an oral tradition. Moreover, there is no telling how traditions such as this come to be made up, but it happens all the time, even in our day and age. It is not always the result of someone lying about it. Sometimes stories just get exaggerated or invented. But this argument ignores how early this story was being circulated. Sometime during the 30s AD, no later than a decade after Jesus' death. This was a period when surely such an incredible claim could have been checked and, if needed, refuted. In fact, we we see this type of apostolic oversight when, for example, Peter and John travel to oversee the Samaritans who have received the gospel. Acts 8. Moreover, Paul mentions eyewitnesses among the 500 that are still alive. It is reasonable to assume Paul himself had met some of them when he went to Jerusalem on his first AD 37 or second AD 46 to 47 visits. How else would he know that some of them were still alive? With his reputation on the line with the church in Corinth, it seems doubtful that Paul would have appealed to such hearsay. 
Through Paul's travels among the earliest Christians in the 30s and 40s AD, he was in a position to investigate such extraordinary claims and the living eyewitnesses themselves. All in all, in spite of the large number, skepticism about this appearance to the more than 500 is unwarranted. The tradition of this appearance is built on the same historical bedrock as the rest of the creedal tradition. It is very early, Paul appeals to those eyewitnesses who are still alive, and most importantly, Paul was in a position to investigate these claims to see whether they were true. According to this creedal tradition and Paul, this remarkable event happened in history. At a gathering, possibly in Galilee, more than 500 men and women believed they saw the risen Jesus. Yes, as Ehrman admits, there is a certain force to this argument, and the historian is pressed to give an answer. That's the end of this week's reading of Dr. Justin Bass's book, The Bedrock of Christianity. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to Dr. Bass's website, as well as this week's cigar. Also in the show notes are links to Treats and Truth Ministry, where you can get involved in helping to spread the gospel to and being a blessing to the homeless. Groundworks Ministries for daily Bible studies and devotionals and the Burning Bush Merchandise Store, where you can pick up some items to help spread the word about the show. And I'd appreciate it if you would tell your friends. So until next week, have a great day, have a great cigar, and God bless. God bless.